All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Raul. So first of all, I want to say apologies for not being able to make it. As you know, it's, um, you know, certain circumstances well be, be outside my control. And, um, and I hope that I can present the talk in more or less the same mode as if I'm there. So if there are questions, you know, please interrupt um, as we go forward. Now, as Rahul indicated, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about, about today about the work we're doing on electrokinetics in viscoelastic liquid um, electrolytes. You know, this is a topic that is not often studied, but I hope to convince you by the end of the talk that it's rich with questions for rheologists and uh, fluid dynamics uh, studies. So the starting point is basically the starting point for electrokinetics, where one has an electrolyte between two electrodes. In this example, the electrodes are held at potentials uh, V0 and minus V0. The electrolyte is assumed to be dilute and binary, monovalent. And in such a situation, the equations are relatively straightforward. They are the equations for conservation of mass, the momentum equation, and an equation, basically the Poisson equation, indicating everything happens in an electric field. And these are the so-called Nernst-Planck equations. Now, typically we assume electrochemical systems are closed and are operated at steady state. And as a consequence, all of the terms that are read crosses through them are eliminated and one ends up with a very simple set of equations to solve for the concentration of ionic species in the electrolyte. And the graph to the right shows you typical results one would obtain by just solving in this case for the concentration of the anion, the negatively charged species as a function of distance Z from the electrode. And the distance is here scaled by L, the anti-electrode spacing. Now I'm showing you these plots in a sort of parametric fashion where I'm plotting the concentration versus Z at different values of the dimensionless current density where the current density is non-dimensionalized by this quantity called JL but will emerge in a moment to be essentially the star of this, um, this analysis. So what you see typically is that at very low values of this J over JL of order say 0.9, the concentrations are straight line with, with Z, meaning that you're under diffusion control. Curiously, what one finds is that for a value of this parameter above about four, the concentration profile is no longer linear. In fact, there's a boundary layer region near the negative electrode in this case. And in that region, it appears that the concentration of anions is zero and the distance that that concentration remains zero becomes larger as the driving force goes up, as J over JL becomes bigger. Now, if you plot the value of J over JL versus the, the, the potential difference between these electrodes, you discover something very curious. So one finds that initially there's an Ohm's law-like regime where J is responsive to the the potential driving force in a linear fashion, but then ultimately reaches a critical value around four and becomes locked to that value. Now, the way to think of this is that this space charge layer, this layer where the anion concentration falls to zero, essentially grows in proportion to the potential that you apply. And so the resistance of the cell basically grows in proportion to the potential difference and the end result is that the current remains fixed. Now this critical value of the current is called the limiting current, and you can think of it as the speed limit at which an electrochemical cell operates. You drive the cell harder, and at least within the framework of the Nernst-Einstein's equations, one would expect that um, you don't get a higher ion flux or higher current as a consequence. Now, of course, we have experiments that we can check whether this is actually true or not. And the experiments tell a somewhat more interesting story as indicated in the chart here. So these are experiments were done by Rubenstein and co-workers in 1998. And what they show is that, you know, indeed, for driving forces V naught, roughly about 
20 to 40 times bigger than the thermal voltage, right, which is about 25 millivolts at room temperature. One finds that, you know, in fact, you do get an Ohm's law regime. One, in fact, also finds that that Ohm's law regime does give way to a limiting regime as predicted. But curiously, when we drive the system to higher potentials, there's a new current that develops. And that current is called the over-limiting current. And this regime is called the over-limiting conducting regime. So it's essentially a violation of what we predicted based on the Nernst Planck equations. And it's the essence of what I want to talk about today, looking at polymer electrolytes and their role in controlling whatever it is that's producing this extra current. Now, we were not the first to think of this question. Um, so recently, some very nice work was done by a group at Stanford, uh, led by Alimani, where they decided to do um, direct numerical simulations of those same equations I showed you at the beginning, the Nernst Planck equations, except in that analysis, no assumption was made about the fact that there's no convection. So convection was maintained, and they solved these equations numerically and found something very curious, as you see on the right-hand side um, of the screen. So what they discovered is that at low impulse potential, so delta phi in their uh, terminology of 0 0.05, you find that there's um, essentially electron neutrality everywhere in the electrolyte bulk indicated by the green um, coloration. But as you move towards the ion selective interface, in this case, um, this would be the negative electrode in the example I showed you a minute ago. What they find is that there's an increase in concentration of the positively charged species. So again, consistent with what you might have expected from the previous um, Nernst Planck analysis. If one drives the system harder, in this case at 0.5 volts, you begin to see these convective rolls develop with a very nice pattern where they have this characteristic of dumping fluid elements to locations along the interface and extracting it uh, from others. Now, if one drives the system even harder, in this example, to three volts, you observe that these rolls become turbulent. And this is kind of interesting because the structure of the turbulence that is created has very similar characteristics to inertial turbulence, except in this case, the Reynolds number is essentially zero. So um, this instability is argued to be the source of the over-limiting conductance, that it essentially produces a convective enhancement of the fusion, and this is what creates the extra current that you see at higher potentials circled in red. So um, why is this important? Well, it turns out to be important for all sorts of reasons, least of which is the fact that in most metal electrodeposition processes, there's a cascade of events beginning with chemistry on the left, and in this case I use lithium to demonstrate it, where the metal reacts with the electrolyte and the reactions produce heterogeneous coverage on the surface of the metal. The heterogeneous coverage results in what's called a passivating layer on the metal that's actually distributed randomly in space. The end result is that there are patches in space indicated with a sort of darker gray color that have higher ionic conductivity than other patches, as a consequence of which the metal tends to deposit preferentially in those patches, forming what are called um, deposition nuclei. And these are the, the sort of hemispherical things of length scale lambda. Now, if one continues to drive the system, these nuclei grow selectively, first because they're curved and so electric field lines tend to concentrate at them. And second, because they're kind of higher, meaning the intellectual distance between the tip of the nuclei and the next electrode is lower. And so deposition tends to concentrate of these nuclei, producing these so-called dendritic uh, morphologies to the right. Now this happens at low currents below the diffusion limit. If one drives the current above the diffusion limit, for the very same reason that Alimani observed, you observe, you basically create a roll cell and the roll cell essentially functions in exactly the same way as the chemistry did in nucleating bumps at the interface. And these bumps basically grow into um, dendrites by a similar morphological instability. So at low currents, chemical instability produces heterogeneity that drives morphological instability at high currents, essentially um, 
convection induced instability, hydrodynamic induced instability drives heterogeneity, which drives dendritic deposition. So this is obviously not useful if you're trying to make a flat surface. And it's certainly not useful if you're trying to make a battery out of these systems because the dendrites can grow to short the cell. So some evidence um, that this connection is, is reasonable uh, comes from relatively old work. This is the work of Ruth et al., which essentially showed in deposition of copper in an optical microscope, you see it in fact pretty much exactly what I just said that there are these structures that are growing from the surface of the electrode and the structures appear to be fed by these flow lines that are bringing material selectively to the tip um, of these structures. Now the, um, the video below essentially shows you the same results uh, measured a few weeks ago in my group where we use fluorescent trace of the particles and you see more or less exactly the same thing. It's a very slow developing film that could easily take the length of this talk if I let it go. But the gist of it is that you see fluid motion in a system that's supposed to be closed and stagnant. And that fluid motion actually is feeding the growth of this morphological instability uh, known as dendrites. So um, one of the interesting questions we wanted to um, understand is um, could the hydrodynamic instability as measured by um, Alimani in simulations, could that exist without the morphological instability? And this video basically is meant to show you just that. So in the video on the right, the membrane is not an electrode anymore, but it's just an ion selective interface. So the cations can go through the interface, but the anions can't. And what you should be seeing is essentially all hell is breaking loose at the interface as the cation being um, selectively transported through it, and we're creating a turbulence-like motion um, in the fluid. And so we believe this is among the first demonstrations of this effect in an ion-selective membrane. And the video to the right essentially is a repeat of something I showed you a minute ago, where you know these roll cells essentially, um, in this case, of the metal electrode causes the, um, the electrode to grow in a random heterogeneous fashion, producing dendritic um, deposition. So, so we wanted to know as um, you know, polymer um, rheologists, polymer physicists, um, is there something we can do? Because after all, this is flow. And polymers are unique for their ability to reduce things like turbulent drag and inertial turbulence. And the question is, was, you know, is there analogous um, physics to what's commonly termed the Tom's effect? Um, in turbulent drag reduction that could be brought to bear here. So at the beginning, we had two hypotheses as to what these physics might look like. And so to the left, I show you a cartoon that says, well, you know, if we were able to make a polymer where the polymer is, um, ex say, entangled, and the spacing between the entanglements are big enough that the ions here shown in green can move essentially freely through the polymer framework, but because the polymer is entangled, the thought is that, well, maybe it can resist the turbulent flow. It can resist the convective flow with the end result that you don't compromise ionic conductivity, but you reduce the flow, right? So that was one thought that we had. The second thought we had was, well, you know, what if you had a polymer that perhaps selectively absorbed at the interface and in fact absorbed much like the field lines and parts of the interface that, that were the most curved? The thinking is that that polymer would passivate those regions of the interface with the end result that you get the deposition of the ions again in green in the valleys and the peaks essentially don't grow too much faster than the valleys with the end result that you get homogeneous deposition. So what I want to talk to you about today is results we've now um, seen from experiments as well as um, uh, theoretical work and at the very end direct numerical simulations that essentially validate um, both of these hypotheses and show that they both work in different ways to produce um, stabler or let's say uh, less chaotic, less random um, electrokinetic flows at interfaces. So, so the, this is a rheology audience. So the polymer is a polymer, as you can tell from the, the G prime, G double prime data. 
We deliberately wanted to choose polymers of high molecular weight, so the entanglement concentrations are relatively low. And in this case, we used PMMA because it has very good affinity uh, for medley electrodes, and it's also pretty stable um, electrochemically. And so what I'm showing you is that as you drive the polymer concentration from about 4 weight percent to 12 percent, you see the behavior change from essentially a viscous liquid to a material that is actually quite dominantly um, viscoelastic. The characteristic time scales, keep in mind, are seconds of order four uh, to five seconds. We can actually calculate a viscosity, and you'll see that it's the, the materials have the usual behavior. They're Newtonian, and then they give way to shear thinning behavior at high enough uh, rates. Now, if we measure the viscosity versus concentration, you see the usual um, weak dependence followed by a strong dependence, which is, again, an indication that the system has become entangled. And very interestingly, we find that if you now measure the conductivity over the entire range of concentration, in fact, the same range where we measure the rheology, it changes almost um, negligibly with temperature and changes at most by a factor of two or so with concentration over a range where the viscosity is changing by orders of magnitude with concentration, indicating that these systems, in fact, do have the characteristics of what we hypothesized. So the next slide essentially shows you that they are actually pretty spectacular in terms of their ability to suppress overlimiting conductance. And so let me introduce this slide. So the, 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 the variables, so what I'm plotting again is the current density versus voltage. So this again is the same plot I showed you from the Nernst Planck analysis at the very beginning, right? So there was an Ohm's law regime followed by a diffusion-limited current, plateau. Here what you see is that in the control case, meaning no polymer, we go immediately from the Ohm's law regime, so that's the black, the black circles, and we diverge immediately. So we come from Ohm's regime and we diverge completely into over-limiting conductance. So we, in fact, never sample the diffusion-limited current regime because this system is so unstable. In contrast, as I add polymer, at progressively higher concentration, you will see that the polymer has the effect of bending over the overlimiting conductance with the end result that I extend the region of voltage where I see um, adherence to the Nernst Planck analysis. Notice that, however, in every case, I do eventually get uh, a, an onset of overlimiting conductance, an onset of instability, but just that the polymer is able to delay it quite significantly and in a sort of orderly uh, fashion. So the videos are meant to show you more or less what I just said. So these are three videos that um, essentially indicate from left to right what happens as zinc is depositing at an interface. To the left, the control, no polymer. The middle, 0.5 weight percent of an 8 million molecular weight uh, PEO. In this case, it's an aqueous electrolyte. And on the right, it's two weight percent. And I think, you know, it doesn't take a lot to see that um, the deposits are kind of more uniform with the polymer, and they don't have this characteristic dendritic um, structure, indicating that the polymer is not just effective in kind of um, suppressing the overlimiting conductance, but is suppressing the phenotype of that conductance, which is the dendritic uh, deposition. So the next slide essentially um, summarizes um, what I just said in a maybe a more uh, straightforward way. It shows you on the top part of the slide basically what happens or what we think happens based on the video and the um, analysis um, in the case of a um, controlled electrolyte, Newtonian liquid, no polymer. And the idea is again that the um, the flow essentially uh, the, the, the electrolyte is essentially at the beginning stagnant, then a convective flow develops. The flow has a certain structure, namely that it dumps ions to the regions in the interface that are the roughest, with the end result that it feeds them and the roughness grows and the dendrites grow. In contrast, at the bottom, I show you what happens with a polymer, where it basically has the ability we think, to more uniformly deliver ions uh, to the interface. 
No, that's all wonderful. Um, but the question was, um, you know, there are two types of instabilities working together. Is this really valid if the system does not have the morphological instability? In other words, if I created an interface that was ion selective, but the interface boundary condition remained the same, it remained flat. In other words, the cations just simply went through the membrane and didn't deposit on it. And so the chart at the bottom essentially shows you what happens in that scenario. So in this experiment, what we do is we have one um, electrode that's a metal, um, copper, and we drive copper to oxidize to form Cu, uh, to form, I said copper, but zinc, to form Zn2 plus um, in the electrolyte. It's driven through the anaphion-like membrane on the other side of the electrode to create the scenario of an ion-selected um, interface. And what you see on the um, bottom chart are the current density voltage diagrams in that case. Again, the control in blue, no polymer in the electrolyte, and with increasing polymer concentration from top to bottom. And again, what you observe is that without polymer, the system goes essentially from the Ohm's law regime directly to overlimiting conductance, meaning that we have um, microscopically this um, electric convective instability. But as the polymer concentration goes up, you see almost exactly what happens in the case of the morphological and hydrodynamic instability that are coupled, namely that the polymer bends the curve over with the end result that the Nernst uh, Planck predictions extend to even higher voltages than you would get in the control case. So this was a good confirmation that you, in fact, the polymer's effect is actually not just in suppressing the morphological instability, but basically in suppressing the um, hydrodynamic instability that drives it. And I, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit off on timing here, so I don't know, um, I, I hope I, have, I leave enough time for questions. So we got a little greedy as, as rheologists often do, right? So we were pretty excited that, um, we can control this phenomenon that's actually many decades old, and uh, we can do it in a way that's relatively simple from the perspective of the application. You can just add polymers to any electrolyte and get the effect that we saw. So we wanted to know, you know, if we had a system where we have even more constraints, right? If we perhaps can enhance the viscosity at lower concentrations to create an entanglement-like effect. And I think many of you know that my group has been working with these hairy nanoparticles that can be added to a liquid electrolyte and they jam at relatively low concentrations indicated by the cartoon in the middle and become highly jammed and glass-like above that concentration. And you can see evidence of these um, uh, phenomena by looking at the rheology. In this case, this is G prime versus uh, strain at constant frequency, in this case of 10 um, uh, reciprocal seconds. And you see that, in fact, G prime increases very rapidly beyond a concentration around 6%. And this is, again, uh, coincident with the onset of jamming. And in fact, if you measure G double prime divided by its value in the limit of zero strain, the graph on the right, you see this telltale maximum emerges at essentially the same range of concentrations. And this is an indication that a system is not just jammed, but it can actually be um, um, yielded or fluidized um, as a result of strain. So the next slide essentially tells you um, the same story that I was telling you before, that if we measure the dimensionless current versus voltage as a function of particle content, we see essentially the same behavior, that in the absence of or with very little um, hairy nanoparticles in the material, we see this um, um, initial Ohm's law regime that gives way to very strong overlimiting conductance. And then this becomes just rapidly suppressed and in fact, just dramatically suppressed because you know, I don't know if you're paying attention to the, the, to the X axis, but it's actually dimensionalized, made non-dimensionless with the uh, thermal voltage. So multiply whatever number you see there by 25.4 millivolts. And that tells you how far we were able to uh, maintain the diffusion limit. So it's indicating, again, just as with the polymers, that the effect appears completely uh, due to the viscosity of the material and its ability to suppress flow once we get the high viscosities of entangled 
systems or jammed uh, systems. Now, one of the things that we really have not been able to, um, to explain that forms the basis of most of what I'm going to tell you um, in the remaining sections of this talk is the fact that, you know, if we measure the width of the extension as a function of the viscosity of the electrolyte, we find that that width, delta V, scales with viscosity roughly as the one quarter power. So it increases with viscosity as the one quarter power. Now, it turns out that one can actually analyze the electric convective instability alone, and Rubenstein and Zaltzman were the first to do that in 2005, and we can predict how delta V should vary with the viscosity and the diffusivity, and that's given in the expression on the top. Um, and basically, the prediction is that the, uh, the voltage window, right, so V0 in their analysis is the maximum voltage at which you can maintain um, um, stability, meaning beyond that voltage, you get this hydrodynamic instability. So if I subtract off the thermal voltage from that, so V naught minus RT over F is basically the width of the window at which I get a diffusion limited regime. And so the prediction from the theory, again, this is a theory just for a simple Newtonian fluid, is that D times eta square root should tell you, tell you the width. Now, what is interesting is that by the um, um, Nernst-Einstein um, um, equation, one would expect D to go roughly as the reciprocal of viscosity, and so one would in fact not expect the width to depend on the viscosity. But if my hypothesis that I start with is right, that I can basically um, break that dependence by making D independent of the structure while the viscosity is, as in an entangled polymer, I should be able to take D out from the square root and get the square root dependence indicated in red. But obviously that's not what I get experimentally. So I do get a power dependence, a power law dependence, but it's not the square root I would expect if D is independent of viscosity. So we wanted to understand that stuff and it led to quite a lot of work. And this work was done in collaboration with my colleague Don Koch. So we basically, again, wrote down the Nernst um, uh, Planck equations but we actually um, put back in the convective term. And so that's the term in red in the flux equations. Mm -hmm. So convective flux to the cation, convective flux to the anions. And we also admitted that in this case, we can actually have the morphological instability. So we did a stability analysis where we perturbed the boundary, right? So you will see the bumps on the cartoon to the right at the electrode. And we represent the perturbation in Fourier space by a growth rate sigma and by a wave number k, which is like 2 pi divided by the wavelength. We also perturb the velocity field. And the idea is that if we now perturb each of these fields, the velocity and the boundary condition, do the perturbations grow or shrink uh, when this system is driven? And so we actually can figure out the sign of the perturbation, um, the growth rate, by essentially just solving the boundary condition uh, for the ion flux. The first equation is the cation flux, which essentially, in this example, grows the interface. It results in a dHdt, which is the height of the interface, and the anion flux, which is zero, because the interface, whether it's a ion selective membrane or a metal, is um, impermeable to the cation, to the anion. Sorry. So, um, so here are the predictions from uh, this kind of analysis you? for the perturbation growth rate um, measured at a particular polymer concentration. In this example, is just 1% of a polymer. Now, N is actually the cone N, so it's the number of cone steps in the polymer. So a, a, a 4 million molecular weight um, PMMA has roughly about 2,000 cone steps. So just keep that in mind. And so the prediction is that, um, and this is the prediction now just for the um, electric convective instability. So this is no morphology. We just turn the morphology off and just look at the, um, the hydrodynamic instability. And so what one sees again without polymer, zero concentration polymer in black, you get um, sigma is essentially always positive and it becomes even more positive as you go to higher wave numbers, which means smaller length scales. And remember this instability begins at the interface. So it's a small length scale effect that grows. So this result is sensible. 
as you increase the polymer molecular weight beyond say about 500 or so Kuhn steps, you begin to see complete suppression of the um, hydrodynamic instability, at least as predicted by linear stability analysis over the range of K. So this is a very good result because it's consistent with what we see in the experiments. We can make a comparison between that result um, and now basically fix the polymer molecular weight and essentially do our experiment, change the concentration. And what we see here is that again, roughly at concentrations above a percent or so, we get very strong suppression. And the suppression obviously is, is weakest at the smallest wavelengths because that's where the instability is the strongest. The right curve shows that the effect is actually um, strong, but not as strong when we have the coupled hydrodynamic and morphological instability. So I, I can, I'll just move on so we can come back to this. So, um, so one of the really interesting um, uh, predictions of this model, and it's, it's actually close to 11 p.m., so I, I have an excuse for forgetting to tell you something important, right? So what I forgot to tell you is that the constitutive model that we use to model the polymer is the so-called roly-poly model. So this is um, the model that was popularized by Tom McLeish and Alexei Lickman, which is one of the, the better models for understanding entangled polymers with fluctuations of the length scale. So that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is that we model the system as a sort of two-fluid model. So this is the Fredrickson type framework the Nuki doi framework, where we think of the polymer as basically interacting with a solvent, but the two are not necessarily coupled. Now, to describe the extent of that coupling, we use what's called a Darcy number, which essentially measures the permeability of the polymer to the solvent or the electrolyte in the, in the system of interest here. And what I'm showing you on the right is that if we plot VCR, so keep in mind that VCR again, just as in the analysis of uh, Rubenstein, is the critical voltage at which the instability comes in. So if I minus a constant from VCR, I get delta V. And so I'm plotting it against this number called PE mix, which is a Peclet number that is roughly the reciprocal of a viscosity. And what we find very interestingly is that if the uh, polymer interacts very strongly with the solvent, meaning that the Darcy number is very small, or the 10 to the minus 12, we find that we in fact recover theoretically the eta to the one half scaling. But as the interaction becomes weaker and weaker, meaning we go from top to bottom, we get a progressively weakening of the dependence of VCR on the viscosity of the medium which we think could help explain the fact that we see not a half, but a quarter dependence, because you can see in the red case, this is the uh, weakest interaction between polymer and solvent. There's almost no dependence whatsoever. So, um, so this is good, but we weren't satisfied with that because we had video telling us that this system might be in fact quite rich or, or perhaps richer. And so, oh, sorry there. So this video basically shows you um, what happens with and without polymer now in detail by resolving the interfacial layer against an ion selective membrane, right? So this is just the hydrodynamic instability. And you will see, pay attention to the interface, the boundary, where you'll see particles that are kind of moving around chaotically um, if you have really good eyes. And in the polymer case, if you look really closely, you'll see at the boundary, they're actually moving around just as chaotically, but in the bulk, far away from the interface, it looks like they're slowed down. So there are two effects. The polymer appears to be um, having an influence that's different in the bulk, more like a viscous influence in the bulk, and an influence that is quite, you know, not expected um, at the interface. So the next slide talks a little bit about, you know, or rationalization of what that might mean or what that may look like and how that rationalization might lead to this weaker dependence of delta V and viscosity um, observed um, experimentally. And, um, and so the idea briefly is that the, um, the fluid flows constrained in a region, the region is of thickness the extended space charge thickness, which is about a micrometers. The velocity at interfaces of order 10 microns per second. 
So the effective share rate the polymer sees in that region is completely different than the average share rate U over H. And to, to appreciate that point, I'm just showing you the, the flow curve, the viscosity versus rate. And you will see that if I use the viscosity in the Newtonian limit, I will predict a more optimistic dependence of viscosity on concentration than if I made that comparison at higher rates. So this would explain why I get a weaker uh, rate dependence because of viscosity that actually is controlling how the polymer influences transport to the interface is not the bulk Newtonian viscosity, but a non-Newtonian shear thinning viscosity in the extended space charge layer. So, um, so I, I just worry that I'm a little bit out of time. And so let me just um, move on really quickly to, to tell you, you know, what we now know about what goes on in that layer. So to understand what happens in that layer, uh, we recently did, um, this is work done by Gao Jin Li, who's a postdoc in Don and my group. So Gao Jin basically developed a numerical analysis, more or less the same as what Alimani did for the Newtonian case. But we did it basically for a Fini CR fluid. So we wanted to look at the effect of elasticity, but didn't want shear thinning. But we did want finite extensibility. So that's what we get to the Fini CR. And in a nutshell, the, the results show something quite unexpected and we think um, quite profound. So what I'm showing you here is essentially the concentration and polymer profiles as a function of distance from the surface under two conditions, right? So the top curve A shows you at a dimensionless voltage of, of 20. So this is already in the turbulent um, unstable regime at a Debra number of zero, which means there's no polymer in the fluid. And next I show you the same result at a Debra number of 10 to the minus two. And remarkably what we find is that whereas in the case of the um, Newtonian liquid, the roll cells are basically stable. They're at equilibrium. With the polymer, they're actually, in fact, not. They're kind of unsteady. So they move around in space and in time. And in fact, if you drill in and look at the trace of the conformation tensor divided by the polymer end to end length near the interface, you kind of understand why. That the regions where the fluid lines converge at the interface, you create a stagnation flow, and that stretches the polymer chains out in that region, but they're only transiently stretched in that region, but they're stretched enough that they prevent an ion flux at that interface, but then they relax, they basically create unsteadiness in the fluid. And this effect is even more dramatically seen when we go to higher voltages, as in C and D, where in C, we see that even the Debra number zero the flow is now turbulent and now unsteady. With the polymer uh, present, it's turbulent and unsteady, but the size of the rolls are substantially smaller in the presence of the polymer. And the presence of hot spots, and these are the regions indicated in white, where you have very large ion fluxes towards the interface, those regions are kind of damp in the presence of the polymer. And so that result is shown better in the figure below where I'm essentially plotting the negative of the um, ion flux to the interface as a function of X, which is a spatial position in the plane. And showing you what happens as the Debra number increases for V is equal to 20, a Debra number of zero, no polymer, you see again, these sort of um, regional concentrations of ion flux as evidenced by the large uh, peaks. And you can see that those get depressed substantially as we add polymer and as the Debra number um, goes up. And the effect is even more convincingly shown in B, where we see at V is equal to 80, right? So this is now something of order now, 50 to 60 times the thermal voltage. You see that the polymer, um, even the Debra number of 10 to the minus two is quite effective. So this is the message, um, hopefully that I communicated to you that um, First of all, A, I would have loved to be there to do this in person so I can get your questions even after the question and answer session. But we, we think that there is a, a pretty important role for polymers in suppressing hydrodynamic instabilities as well as morphological instabilities that are driven by those instabilities. We believe that polymers extend the diffusion limited regime. And I think most importantly, the last bullet, we believe they do it by this unusual process 
where in the bulk, they appear to just essentially exert viscous drag on the liquid without influencing the ions. And at the interface, they appear to apply, to, to create unsteadiness in the fluid flow that essentially makes the flux at the interface more uniform. So these are the students who've done the work. Um, so I'm lucky to have had really good students. And these are the agencies that have funded the work. And I hope I have a, some minutes to answer your questions. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, that's, that was perfect timing. And we have all five minutes for questions. Questions? But I was a little afraid that maybe I was speaking for 45 minutes and we had lost the connection because it was so silent. Yeah, yeah so this is Mahesh Thiram Kudlu from IIT Bombay. Um, so I have this question regarding uh, the formation of dendrites. I would have expected that increasing the viscosity would have brought down uh, the velocity of the rolls or the chaotic motion that you saw, which indeed happened. And therefore, I would have expected that the dendritic growth would have reduced rather than increase. So Rahul, I'm going to have to ask you to repeat the question because I couldn't hear anything. I know someone is speaking. Right. What should I do? Just ask them. Okay. Uh, so the question was regarding the dendritic growth that you showed. Mm -hmm. um, and you showed that when you increase the viscosity, uh, the chaotic flow, the turbulent flow reduced. And I would have expected the dendritic growth to, um, well, to be higher uh, in the present when the uh, chaotic flow was lower. And so I thought that if you have more chaotic flow, the dendritic growth should have been less. Um, that's, a, that's actually a very interesting question. And so um, it's an interesting question because in truth, that if you had just convection that was sort of agnostic about the, um, the interface, you would be exactly right. But in this case, because the convection has a certain structure, the structure, in fact, is what's problematic. It isn't the convection itself. And did, do, you understand, do you get that? That basically it's the periodicity of the convection, the fact that it tends to dump things at certain regions. That is what ends up being the problem. Yeah, I think he is satisfied. Uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, you want to? Yes. What is the order of the wavelength that we would see with the hydrodynamic stability versus the order of the wavelength that would have happened had there been no analysis? I don't do it. I forgot. <laughs> Um, my question is, what is the order of the wavelength that you would have seen from the hydrodynamic uh, instability at the interface versus the, uh, the theoretical order of the wavelength that you would see from the pure morphological instability, say from Sundstrom and Bark? Okay, so, um, so I think I got most of that question. So the... Um so it turns out that the, you know, so the, there's a cutoff wavelength, obviously. And so that comes from the size of the system, right? And so that um, essentially constrains the, you know, the largest wavelengths you can ever see. But what we've discovered is that there's another length scale that cuts off the, um, the wavelength distribution. And that length scale is actually the thickness of the extended space charge layer. So the, you know, so this behavior that I described to you, right? So there's a, an equilibrium space charge layer that forms at any surface that's immersed in an electrolyte, right? This is a so-called device screening length. 
But the point is that when you drive a flow or, or you drive an electric field now to create ion depletion, you get an, a, an extended region of space charge and that region can actually be of order 100 times to the by length. And so there's a, so that actually ends up cutting off the maximum size of the wavelength of the instabilities that you see, whether they're hydrodynamic or morphological. And the point is that the spectrum is more or less continuous from there on down, meaning that you get essentially all length scales that are smaller than that, that we can detect. Okay, thank and you. And, and keep in mind that the length scales are not explicit. These are not rods, these are trees. And so the trees have branches and the branches are, have their own length scales. And so when I say all length scales are seen, I mean in that sense. Uh, hello, this is Anubhav Roy from IIT Madras. My question is regarding the last part where you were showing the simulations with the Feeney model. So I was wondering, in that case, do the stretch polymers in those convective cells uh, in induce a hoop stress that gives rise to a secondary elastic instability? Yeah, I'm so sorry. I got the first part that your question was about the last part of the talk. But so, I didn't get the part about, I so, didn't get any of the, the, the okay. substance of the question. So can someone who's closer to the mic repeat it? So I'm asking that the polymers in the convective cells, do they get stretched and that hoop stress drives a secondary elastic instability or even a elastic turbulence? Um, oh, I see. Well, so, um, well, so that's a, an interesting question because we can actually calculate, you know, the trace of the conformation tensor with respect to the fully stretched out line. And we're just about 10% of the, you know, the full extension of the polymers. So, um, so, so it appears that the criteria for getting to things like elastic turbulence aren't met, but there are other effects that are elastic that appear to be just as interesting. Okay, uh, one last question. Um, would you like to? Easy for you, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so can someone repeat? It was a nice short question, but I heard uh, nothing. Yeah. Uh, Lyndon, this is Ron. Great talk. Uh, question. Hey, Ron. If you go to lower polymer molecular weights where you don't have um, the shear thinning, you should then recover the one half power law instead of the one quarter in your experiments. And I'm wondering if that's something you tried or would want to try? Yeah, no, that's that's a good question. So that is true. So um, so that would be one way to kind of um, differentiate between the two mechanisms I showed you. Uh, an even more interesting possibility is if one can create polymers that are more involved with the fluid. So, um, so remember that one of the two um, uh, contentions was that if you couple the polymer and the fluid more tightly, then you get this one half power dependence. And we think we know how to do that. We think if we um, use polymers like PEG and ions like lithium, they have a very strong affinity for each other. And so this is one way to get to, you know, to that hypothesis. And of course, the other method is the one you just described, Ron. So if you can actually indeed um, just measure the viscous effects um, at molecular weights below the um, where you the Weissenberg numbers are to one, even on the small length scales, we should be able to see this one half power dependence as well. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker again. For All right. Thank you. Yeah.